I tell you, you know, one thing we, you know, we've been talking about the activities at the Tumblr House building. One thing we haven't talked about is the absolute frenzy that the Tumblr House building has been in to publish these two new books from Tumblr House. Uh, Birth Control by Halliday Sutherland. Um, a Statement of Christian Doctrine Against the Neo-Malthusians. Those nasty Neo-Malthusians. And Gold, Frankincense, and Myrrh by Ralph Adams Cram. Okay, so let's start with let's start with birth control first. Let's start with birth control. Now these are both books that we're publishing based on your recommendation. Um, now I feel grandiloquent. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, oh, on the cover by Charles Quinn, chillingly prophetic. Yeah. Because this was written so about uh, it was written in the twenties. In the twenties, but it feel the way he talks about this, it's like he just writ wrote this ten years ago or something. Yeah. Um. So, uh, is there anything you'd like to say about this? Oh yeah. Well, firstly, uh, as I mentioned in the foreword, Halliday Sutherland uh, was an interesting character. He was a convert, an English convert. Scots, I guess, Sutherland's a Scots name, uh, of the era of Chesterton and Bellock and all that. And he knew he knew those guys. Yeah. But he was a, um, what do I say, he was a doctor, a medical doctor. Uh, and before he became a Catholic, he was a convert. Uh, he, before he became a Catholic, he became a practicing medical doctor. And he specifically worked amongst the poor. And one of the things you notice in the English slums of the time, and again, you can almost think of Charles Dickens, you know, and, yeah. and, and uh, A Christmas Carol, because they were not that far removed. Some of the slums, in fact, they were worse. Yeah. Because they were more industrialized and, and had, you know, another, another 70 or 80 years of pollution dumped on top of them. Well, a huge percentage of the poor children in the English slums had tuberculosis. Oh, Yeah. And he had pledged himself to fighting tuberculosis. Now, what made this even worse is that in those days, the only way you could really tackle tuberculosis is to send somebody out of town to a sanitarium to recover. You yeah. know, and these places were like resorts. Oh, wow. But, so it wasn't so, for the poor. No, it wasn't for the poor. And the poor died of TB, you know, just like flies. Worse. It would get into the milk. The what? The milk. The, the, oh, the, the milk. Drank. Yeah. Oh man. And so, and people would sell tubercular milk because it was cheap. Ah. Ten thousand children a year died of tuberculosis when Halliday Sutherland began his his career. Gosh. Ten thousand. Now, at the same time, they had the eugenics movement, which said that these slum dwellers and all that really needed to go. And that, although it was unpleasant, tuberculosis was a good thing because it was purging the population of these people. Well, he became a Catholic. And then, having become a Catholic, uh, went off and went on a writing career, which is how I encountered him. He did a lot of travel writing. Yeah. And you would never imagine that the jolly, lighthearted man who wrote Hebridean Adventure and Lapland Adventure and all that. Mm -hmm. Wrote this. Because here, what he does is he attacks birth control root and branch and shows what uh, he first encountered it because it was pushed by the eugenicists in his time. Uh, there was a lady in England when he was when he was running around called Marie Stopes. It was like the Margaret Sanger of England. Mm. And he, uh, he made some comments about her in this book, and said that, you know, she was a eugenicist and basically wanted to wipe out the poor and the unfit, as she could consider them, and the colored and so forth. And she took him to court. She uh, accused him of uh, uh, defamation of character and so forth. Uh, she won the first round. No, I'm sorry, he won the first round. Then she won on appeal, and then went all the way up to the House of Lords, who were not particularly pro-Catholic, mm. and he won. Ooh. So it's interesting because when you read uh, or, or see movies about Marie Stokes, and they've made them, 
you know, she's the heroine. Of course, you've got this terrible man doing this and, and pursuing her all the way to the House of Lords. Of course. Except that she initiated the action. Yeah. And, yeah, she lost a ton of money over the deal. Uh, but, you know, if she kept her mouth quiet mm -hmm. and accepted the truth about herself, yeah, she wouldn't have lost the money. Anyway, uh, Halliday Sutherland, um, and I'll take this opportunity also to point out that Halliday Sutherland's nephew, or, uh, grandson, Mark Sutherland, has a tremendous uh, website on his grandfather's work in total. Not just this, um, and I recommend it highly. You'll be able to, you'll see the the dress in here. Okay, um, but you know, he he attacks birth control both logically. Or, excuse me, the, the the Malthusian argument. He attacks it logically, yeah. how it's bogus, but also he attacks it spiritually. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. So it, it shows you that humanity vitae, like or like uh, natural family planning, was not initiate. It was not instituted or initiated by humanity vitae. That this was always. Uh, well, actually, I don't know how long it was it was prevalent, but he definitely is uh, espoused a natural family uh, plan uh, planning back then. Yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, they had they had in the fifties uh, what was called the rhythm method. Yeah. Uh, which uh, they called rather um, uh, snidely Vatican roulette. And the the uh, interestingly though, my uh, my parents practiced it. Uh, because when my brother was born, he was cesarean, mm -hmm. as, as was I. And they, the doctors told my parents when my brother was born that if they had another kid within seven years, it would kill my mother. So they weren't going to use the artificial stuff, they used the rhythm method. I was born seven years, one month, and one day after my brother. <laughs> okay. I never asked them about that. Yeah. You don't want to, you, you don't, there, there are conversations you don't want to have with your parents. That's one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to read some of these quotes. Uh, I've extracted some quotes from this book just to show you guys, give you a flavor, and show you uh, how awesome uh, Halley Sutherland is. Uh, in an age in which thought and reason are suppressed by systematized confusion and spiritless perplexity, the very simplicity of a truth will operate against its general acceptance. Mm. Wow. Malthus did a greater and a more evil thing. He forged a law of nature, namely that there is always a limited and insufficient supply of the necessities of life in the world. That's see, that's anti-biblical. That's you know we say God will provide. No, he's saying no. That's not true. And it's, it's also anti-reality. It's a, and it's a, and it's anti-reality. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I will read two more. From the theological point of view, the myth of overpopulation is definitely of anti-Christian growth because it assumes that, owing to the operation of natural instincts implanted in mankind by the Creator, the only alternative offered to the race uh, uh, is a choice between misery and vice, an alternative utterly incompatible with that divine goodness in the government of the world. Wow. And last one is, is a short one. Moral catastrophes inevitably, ine excuse me, inevitably lead to physical catastrophes. Yeah. And that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. And oh, one last thing, one last thing out of, uh, we have on the appendix, we felt it prudent to put Humanae Vitae. Because it was the 50th anniversary of Humanae Vitae. Uh, if you guys are anything like me, You've spent your whole life just not needing to read Humanae Vitae because you know what it says, so you don't need to read it ever mm -hmm. because you already know, right? We already know. <laughs> you don't know. You don't so, know what it says. So I put I put it as an appendix for everybody who's like me and who has never actually read Humanae Vitae yet. So there it is for you guys. Uh, you guys well, are interested. And I, and I have to say about Humanae Vitae, he predicted, Paul VI predicted the dating scene of today. Ah, yeah. Yes, he did. There's a, there's a one last book, a third last book. book. What you got there? That, that we've been hyping up. Gold, Frankincense, and Myrrh by Ralph Adams Cram. Another book uh, which you've done the forward for. You've oh, wow. recommended to us. Uh, tell us about this book, Charles, and why it's 
Why you recommended it? Why we had to uh, had to do this? I don't know. I just I was drunk. No, uh, I wrote this book. I wrote this book. I did not write this book. I read this book. Well, first thing you got to know who Ralph Adams Cram was. In one sentence, he was the greatest church and college architect this country has ever produced. Mm. And from about 1890, 1900, well, 1900 in particular, to 1940, all across this great land of ours, from St. Vincent's Church in L.A. and the Doheny Library at USC, all the way to the Church of the Ascension in Boston, to West Point, to the uh, uh, postgraduate school at Princeton, and there are all sorts of cities, towns, and whatnot in between. Literally, the American countryside is filled with Ralph Adams Graham buildings. He worked most often in neo Gothic, but not only. So, for instance, if you go to St. Vincent's today here in LA, it's in Spanish Baroque, and I mean, it is jaw dropping. Mm. So, had his only, uh, had Graham's only work been architecture, which is what he's best known for, that would have been something. He also, in his early days, was a writer of very uh, chilling ghost stories. But that's not his only claim to fame for us. Cram was raised Unitarian in New England. Well, true story. His dad was a Unitarian <laughs> minister. Does he get more Yankee than that? No. Nope. He married a Southern girl, though, daughter of a Confederate veteran, so uh -oh. you see, he, he bridged the gap. Yeah. But when he was on, on a visit to Rome with a friend of his, uh, as a young man, he converted to Anglo-Catholicism. His friend became a, Catholic, a Roman Catholic, Catholic, you know. But he became very, very high church, very um, Anglo-Catholic. Uh, went back to Boston was uh, instrumental in bringing a religious order of the, the uh, uh, Cowley Fathers from England to Cambridge, Mass, where they still are. In fact, it's their only remaining house. It was an order that once was all around the British Empire, and then I've only got one monastery left, and that's in the United States. <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, but he was very pro Rome. Mm -hmm. He was one of the co-founders of Commonweal, back when Commonweal was Orthodox. He was a great friend of Chesterton and Bellick. And the only reason he didn't come into the church, I think, after researching the issue, is because at the time that he lived, it looked as though the Anglo-Catholic project of Catholicizing all of Anglicanism and bringing it into corporate reunion with Rome uh -huh. was going to work. Mm. Had he been around another 15 years, that might have looked different. Yeah. And of course, if he were alive today, I have no doubt he'd be in the ordinary. Absolutely not. It's kind of fitting that his company designed the Ordinariates Cathedral in Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Graham and Ferguson designed it. So, anyway, he wrote, and it, it, with all that, um, you know, said, he'd be an interesting fellow. But he wrote a series of books starting before the First World War and ending just before he died about politics and religion and the interplay between. Of them, the one that I consider at once the shortest and the most pithy. Pithy, yeah. Pithy. I mean, it, it, it works as a real good introduction to his political thought, mm -hmm. to his religio-political thought, or political-religious thought, if you prefer. Is this book, Gold, Frankincense, and Myrrh? No. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead, continue. Now, basically, he argues, or he's writing in uh, the time of World War I, uh, I believe. I think so. Maybe I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, just after 1919. Uh, but these two, there were a series of talks that he gave during the war. And the gold is monasticism. He's of the belief that Western society, and this... By the way, I mentioned, I mentioned he was bringing the Cowley Fathers to America. He wasn't just about talk. Yeah. That was his way of trying to contribute. Um, he believed that Western society needed three things to survive. One was a return to the monastic ideal, revival of it. 
the second, and this is really the strongest part of the book, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. the frankincense, is the need for sacramentalism, a sacramental view of life, to every element. As compared to materialism. Yeah. Uh, or, or mere spirituality, you know, vaguely off the clouds somewhere. And then lastly, uh, decent philosophy, by which you meant a realistic philosophy. Uh, Plato and Aristotle and all them guys. So, uh, it's very well written, uh, it's very interesting, uh, and I, I emphasize, as Anglicans go, he wasn't merely an Anglo-Catholic, he was also what's called a papalist. And a papalist is an Anglo-Catholic who, in the good old days, believed that the Pope was indeed the proper head of the church. And as I say, worked for the corporate reunion of all of Anglicanism with, uh, with Rome. Sadly, that was not how it worked out. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, if this will act as a, an introduction to Cram's thought, will have done something. I also should point out that he was the founder or co-founder of the Society of King Charles the Martyr in uh, the United States, and also the Order of the White Rose, which was Jacobite. It's one of the predecessor communities uh, for the Royal Stewart Society, which I remember. Right up your alley. Yeah. Well, see, I like people who like what I like, and I agree with people who hold what I hold. I'm, you don't look impressed by that last statement. Boy, boy, isn't that so unusual? Yeah, it is. Most yeah. people really get into fights with people who agree with them. Yeah. Not me. Um, the, your favorite, so your favorite chapter is sacramentalism of the three, but they're all good. My yeah. favorite of the three is the monasticism one, and I kind of wanted to talk about this. This is somewhat reminiscent of um, uh, Dreyer's uh, Benedict Option, somewhat, yeah. I think. Yeah. And I want to read the quote. And then we'll talk about it. Uh, this it's it's a lengthy quote. Bear with me, but it fully encompasses uh, his thought. I uh, I believe. In the beginning, in the time of Pacomius and the hermits of the desert, the unit was the individual. I'm talking about the monastic unit. So it's the hermits. Basically. Yeah, the unit was the individual, wholly withdrawn from the world and isolated in his mountain cave or on the top of his column, if his taste led in that direction. St. Benedict increased this unit through exalting the idea of human fellowship, and thereafter it consisted of groups, either of men or women, forming a centralized community. Then, St. Ignatius Loyola increased the size of these groups, giving them the centralized control of an army, now the time has come for a further extension of the great idea, not to the exclusion of the monastic unit or of the individual unit, but to supplement them. This new unit will be the family, men, women, and children, in that most holy unit of all, which is the Christian family, gathering together in places withdrawn from the world, as the world is now and has been for nearly five centuries where they can build up what I like to call walled towns. No more of the world than is the monastery, but like that con constituted on lines of order, simplicity, and righteousness. And with the ultimate uh, goal, not simply of hiding away, but of transforming the society around them. He actually wrote a book called Walled Towns. That's interesting. So, but, you know, we... <laughs> no, I'm serious. It goes into it in much greater detail. That's interesting. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Um, but we had discussed the Benedict Option 10, 20 episodes ago, no. and you seem to be against it. Well, I'm against it from the standpoint of simply withdrawing from the world, because that does, that's, doesn't work. Setting up settlements along the, the lines that you'd like to see everything set up, Mm -hmm. and creating, as it were, missionaries to go back out and transform mm -hmm. the world, that's always a different color. But, I mean, I've looked at, at the examples of, in recent decades, Mary Crest, St. Benedict Center, um, well, even some of the Catholic worker communities. What has succeeded, what has failed? What has failed is the idea that you can pull your children out of this, build something nice, 
and it'll go on that way. It won't. It can't. Because the children do not and will not understand what it is you fled. I see. That makes sense. Now, whereas, if you have such a place, it allows the, the parents to teach their children about the outside, what's out there, why it's the way it is, etc., etc., mm -hmm. and it gives the children the choice. Do you want to go out, go back out, and try to make something better of it? Mm. You want to stay here and try to build up what we're doing, you know. And for that matter, and I hate to see a line from the Amish, but they have an interesting system in that they allow their children to go for a year to the city. Interesting. And live any way they want, usually very immorally, of course, today. Okay. Uh, and then they may then they have to make the decision whether to come home or not. Oh. If they don't, uh, and this is where I wouldn't do it. If they, uh, if they decide to stay there, they're cut off forever. Wow. Whereas what I propose is that in such a setup, the kid would, would be able to be, would be in a position to understand whether his, his personality and his abilities would better serve trying to transform the outside or to come back home. Yeah. And But mind you, either decision being okay and either being coordinated with... Yeah. So in other words, he wouldn't just be left off on his own as the Amish kid is stuck. Instead, you know, if uh, all right, you decide you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna stay there, what are we gonna do then? Are you gonna go to business? Are you gonna go to school? And that would all be worked out, as I say, with his parents in the community. Okay. I mean, well, born in mind, he would have to be a witness. He'd be a missionary. Mm -hmm. What there would not be is simply the. Existence for the sake of existence. I see. 